noticed in the video that there was as many adults involved as the kids. Uh, that's because everybody had a good time this year. And I want to say it was certainly a blast, and hopefully the kids will take away something uh, from it. If nothing else, uh, somebody said yesterday that maybe some of our adults as well as our children learned that we can have fun in church. The Bible says there's a time for everything. There is a time to weep and a time to mourn, but there is a time to laugh, and there is a time. The Bible says that laughter is like a medicine. We don't have to always uh, be serious about everything. Uh, God has a sense of humor. I, I know that by looking at some of you this morning. <laughs> Genesis chapter 2 this morning. Today is Father's Day. And we very seldom hear, when we, when we hear about Father's Day, we very seldom hear the word sacrifice when it comes to our fathers. And, and this word has really been with me uh, for the last several days. Just the word sacrifice in itself has been with me this whole entire week. Uh, a lot of times when we think about, uh, we think about sacrifice, we, we often tend to think about mothers, and I've heard the old proverbial phrase for years and years that if there was uh, four slices, or there was four people and three slices of pie, then mom would be the one that decided that she didn't want one. And I understand that mothers do make a lot of sacrifices, but there are a lot of fathers that make a lot, of, a lot of sacrifices as well. And one of the sacrifices that I want to begin with talking about this morning is his Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1. Will you stand with me as we give reverence to the Word of God this morning? Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22 and verse number 1. Genesis 22, verse number 1. It came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful, God, Lord, for what you've done all week. We thank you, God, thank you, God, for what you're doing today, right now. We know, dear God, that Father's Day, Lord, can sometimes be a day of sorrow. We pray, God, that you'd comfort those, dear Lord, that still mourn the loss of their father or grandfather. I pray, dear God, that you would comfort those, dear God, that... Lord, just might need a touch from you today. All the needs that's been mentioned here today, so many stand in need of a touch. But I pray most especially, God, for those that we have right here, right now in this service, God, that you would use me, God, uh, to send the anointing, that you may speak the words that's needful for this very hour. I pray, dear God, that you would help us all to open our ears, that we might hear what the Spirit would say uh, to the church today. I pray, God, if there be one under the sound of my voice that does not know you in the free pardon of sin, I pray, God, for your spirit of conviction to dwell with them, to minister to them, to draw them unto you before it's everlasting too late. Have your will and your way in this service, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. And the church says, Amen. Amen. And you may be seated here this afternoon. Abraham was a father that, that 
had to make a decision. Now, most of you understand and knows very much at all about the Bible, knows that Abraham went for a hundred years without a son. His wife, Sarah, they thought that they would never, ever have a child. Back in biblical days, it was a very big deal if you did not have a son to pass on your, your wealth and, and your inheritance. It was a very big deal if you didn't have someone to pass it along to. And in their eyes, God had somehow condemned them if he did not bless them with a man-child. Abraham and Sarah continued faithfully to believe that God would work something out. Although Sarah and Abraham tried to work out a different plan, Sarah and Abraham tried to go a, a different route. Let me tell you something. You can always try to work it out, but God will eventually get around to where He wants things to be. Can you say amen? So I, I thought all week about this word sacrifice and how that in our society... It's not really in our vocabulary anymore. If they'll pull up for me, I want to show you what the definition to sacrifice really is. What exactly is a sacrifice? A sacrifice is the act of giving up something that is prized or desirable. Sacrifice. A lot of times you hear the word sacrifice, you think of your mother. You're thinking of her giving up something out that is prized or desirable. Abraham, the Bible said, waited for his child. He was a hundred years old. And when his child was of the right age, God came down and the Bible said he desired to tempt Abraham. Sometimes God wants to see if things in your life mean more to you than God does. So God will place a test in your life. God had waited until Abraham was a hundred years old before he gave him a child. Why did God do that? Why did God wait until Sarah, the Bible said, was 90 years old and was past the, uh, uh, the manner of women, Sarah said? But yet at the right time, the Bible said that God sent an angel to Abraham and said, you are going to have a son. Yeah. The Bible said while the angel was speaking to Abraham that Sarah was in the tent eavesdropping and trying to see what was going on. And the Bible said that when the angel said, you're going to have a child, that Sarah laughed and said, oh, it cannot be. How is it, Sarah said, that I'm above women? I've gone out from having children. But let me tell you, when God says something's going to take place, it's going to happen. Can you say amen? So the Bible says that after Isaac grew, and no doubt Abraham loved his son, no doubt Abraham loved the son that God had given him, but God had to prove not only to him but to Abraham that God still had to come first. Last Sunday the message was about, I seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and then all these other things shall be added unto you. We are in a society where we don't make sacrifices anymore. We live for the moment. We live for what makes us happy. How, the phrase that goes around, if it feels good, just do it. We live in a society where we are so consumed and worried about our own flesh that we take no time for God. Abraham had to make a sacrifice. He had to prove to God that he loved God above anything else. God asked him to give up no doubt the thing that Abraham loved above anything else in this world, God had to know that he was still number one in his life. So he said, Abraham, Abraham said, yes, sir. 
God said, that son that I just gave you, I want you to give him back to me. So I want you to go to a mountain that I will tell you of, and I want you to offer him up to me. The Bible doesn't say that Abraham argued. Abraham didn't uh, uh, fuss with God. But the Bible said that he took, a, uh, took his son Isaac and some servants and they went out. Listen, they didn't even know where they were going. God said, I'll tell you when you get there. So they laid out and the Bible said how they got close, they started to see the mountain in the distance. Abraham said, that's the place. They unloaded everything and I love the testimony of Brother Abraham. Brother Abraham said, listen boys, me and my son going on top of the mountain to worship God and then we're coming back. Let me tell you, God I may have tested him, but Abraham knew that he had waited that long for God to hear and answer his prayer and that God wasn't going to leave him high and dry. There are some of you that thinks that God has forsaken you. How do you think God has left you and because things aren't working out I'm the way that you think they should. But I want to tell you today that God's got a plan. God's got a plan for your life. God's got a way. The things ought to be done in your life and you're not going to be happy until God gets control. Can you say amen? I may be only talking to one, but somebody, somebody God wants you to know this morning that He still loves you. God still cares for you. God told Abraham to offer up Isaac. It's further illustrated of this faith. As they walked up the mountain, let me tell you, as they walked up the mountain, Isaac was versed enough in sacrifice that he looked around at his daddy and said, I see the wood for the sacrifice. I see the fire. Eh? Uh, we have the knife. Eh? Uh, it seems Dad that you've got everything in order. Eh? Uh, but there's something that you have forgotten. Abraham said God shall provide. Woo, thank you Lord. God shall provide. How do you think it must have looked when they got to the top of the mountain, and like I said, somebody talked about this the other night, as they began to lay the, the wood in order, as they began to get the sacrifice ready. Listen, Isaac knew exactly what was going on. But Brother Roger, he still didn't see a sacrifice. How do you think poor Isaac must have thought when his daddy said, turn around, son, and he bound him up with the rope and laid him on top of the rock. Let me tell you something. I believe with all of my heart that was one of the hardest things that Abraham had to do. You know the Bible doesn't say that there was any conversation that took place. But I've been around long enough to know that you can speak volumes and not say anything at all. You see, we live in a different society. We live in a different age. See, in biblical times, when Abraham tied up his son and put him on the offering to offer him, when he put him up on that altar, listen, Isaac, I don't believe said a word. I don't believe he argued. I don't believe he got down and threw any kind of fit. The Bible doesn't record that at all. The Bible only records that he tied his hands and put him on that altar. But can you imagine with me this morning. Isaac may not have said a word, but can you imagine the pain and the anguish that was in Isaac's eyes when he looked at his father? I'm trying to remember as they were walking up the hill, as he clearly asked his father, where was the sacrifice? And he said, God would provide. Isaac, no doubt, laying there thinking, has God made me? Has I have I been the one that's been provided for the sacrifice? 
Abraham loved his only son. Abraham loved his only son. I say his only son before anybody. It wasn't his only son, but it was his true bloodline son. It is the son that God had promised. It was the son that would receive the inheritance. And it was Abraham's son that he loved. If you can picture with me the look of anguish that came, the look of questioning, eh, no doubt uh, Isaac may have been trembling, eh, I, no doubt uh, I wanted to resist but knew that he shouldn't. Eh, I, can you imagine the anguish eh, as Abraham tried um, to look back down into the eyes of his son and with that same expression eh, I show him enough love eh, I, that he was sorry for what I was about to take place eh, but still try to show love that it was going to be okay. Are y'all still with me? Still going to be okay because I'm still believing in a miracle. I'm still believing, son, that God's going to take care of this. You see, Abraham, no doubt in his mind, was saying, I don't understand why God would bring me to this mountain. I don't understand why God would wait a hundred years to give me a son and then take him away. Let me tell you, that was one side of his mind. That was the flesh crying out. But I can guarantee you eh, that the Spirit of God, eh, I was also speaking in the other ear. Eh, I say I'm the same God eh, that brought you this son. Eh, as, if, eh, as if you do take him, eh, I'm that same God God's able to give him back to you or raise another one just like him. Can you say amen? With those ears or with those eyes. I'm just trying to picture the father as he looked down at his son, the expression that he tried to convey to his son that it was going to be okay. No doubt Isaac and Abraham both thought that it was over. When Abraham, and I'm sure it took him a long time to build that altar. I'm sure it took him a long time to get everything in order. I'm sure it took a long time for him to tie up his son and lay him on that old altar. Because he kept waiting for God to intervene. Hello? Some of y'all waiting for God to intervene. Some of y'all waiting for God because we just got through singing a song about how God's an on-time God. Huh? Let me tell you something. He's always on time. He may be four days in getting there, and I'm not going to say four days late because he wasn't late. And God didn't intend, Jesus didn't intend to get there until the fourth day. I, let me tell you, he wanted to make sure that Lazarus was good and dead so that nobody could say, well, he was just laying in there asleep. Jesus said, I'm going to wait till he's good and dead so that when he is called from the grave that they shall believe. But I want to tell you, I believe with all of my heart that Abraham took his time in getting his child to that altar. I took his time. But listen, there come a time when Abraham finally had to take a hold of that knife. Now come the real test. You see, the test wasn't finding the mountain. The test was not climbing the hill. Woo, thank you, Lord. I said the test was not climbing the hill. The test was not tying him up. The test was not getting everything in order. The true test came when Abraham took a hold of that knife and raised it over his head. You see, that was the final submission. That was the final light. And God, the Bible said, God sent an angel to say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I can now see that you love God above all. Whoo, thank you, Lord. And now, all of a sudden, let me tell you, as much as they've been waiting, as long as he's been stalling, as long as he's been listening, 
now all of a sudden, Abraham said, I hear a ram in the thicket. I thought about that this morning, Brother Ricky, and I don't know who was probably, listen, I don't know who was probably more anxious to hear the bleeding of that ram, Isaac or Abraham. But both of them were glad that God had provided. Can you say amen? Amen. Even though Abraham almost went, even though Abraham almost made the sacrifice, he didn't have to do it because there would have been nothing accomplished in that sacrifice. There would have been nothing, nothing at all that would have been accomplished in that sacrifice. But God wanted mankind to know how it felt to lose the one and only thing that you truly love. We find the story actually continues in John chapter 3. One of the most quoted scriptures John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. The sacrifice. You see, Abraham and Isaac, there was a sacrifice that could have taken place, that could have taken place, but it would not have accomplished anything. The sacrifice of Abraham and Isaac accomplished exactly what it needed to in that Abraham proved his love to God. But now we have the reversal. Now God wants to prove how much he loves mankind. See, Abraham could have offered Isaac and that sacrifice. What did we say the meaning of the sacrifice was? The giving up of something that you love. A lot of times we come to church and we think we've made a sacrifice by coming to church. See, you really haven't given anything because some of you Some of you only come to church when there's nowhere else to go. I've heard people tell me before, you see, a lot of folks don't understand fasting either. Fasting is a sacrifice. Fasting is when you give up something that you really love. You give it up, you make a sacrifice, you you show God... Ooh, thank the Lord. Abraham had to prove to God that he was willing to give the thing that he loved the most unto God. Hello? So I have people come to me once in a while and say, and, and folks ask me all the time about fasting. Fasting is to give up something, it's to make a sacrifice. It's to give up something that you really desire. So if somebody comes to me and said, I'm not hungry, I didn't really feel like eating breakfast this morning, so I fasted this morning. Not hardly. Fasting is to give up something. I'll tell you where fasting comes in. Fasting is when you wake up in the morning and you feel like you could gnaw the legs off the table. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But while you're sitting there at the table, your mind begins to be pressed about something that you need. So maybe you're sitting there and you're praying about a need. Woo, hallelujah. Maybe you're praying about something that you feel like you got to have from God. And so you know what? 
you push it back. And you say, Lord, this is how serious I am. I'm going to give this to you today to show you how serious I really am. See, we don't give very many sacrifices to God. We don't give very many sacrifices to God. We come to church, and because we've come to church, we think that we've done a great deal. Oh, y'all going to get quiet. That's okay. Whether y'all amen or not, I'm still going to preach. Whenever we come into the house of God, some of us do make a sacrifice. Maybe you are physically unable to really be here. And you push yourself ahead. You have truly made a sacrifice. But some of us have no excuse. We come in and we want to sit on our seat. Don't ask me to sing. Don't ask me to don't, don't ask me to pray. Don't ask me to testify. Do what you got to do and let me get out of here. Hello? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that some folks in Bremen, no, that some folks in Kentucky, no, that who? Whosoever believeth in him. That means Bremen, Greenville, I know, I'm sorry. That means Georgia, California, sorry. That means Africa, that means China, Japan, Whosoever believeth in him should not perish. God said, I tell you what, I love you so much, and this is how I'm going to prove that I love you. I'm going to give my only begotten son, and I'm not just going to give him, but I'm going to let him grow up. I'm going to teach him the law. I'm going to teach him to be a Jew. I'm going to teach him how to live the good life. But when he reaches 33 and a half years old, I'm going to watch you beat him and mutilate him and kick him and punch him and put a crown of thorns on his head. And then I'm going to watch you drag him through the streets of Jerusalem and to a hill called Golgotha. I'm going to watch you slam him on the ground and let you drive nails in his feet and hands and raise him up between heaven and earth and place a sign above his head that says King of the Jews to prove to you how much I love you. Now, Abraham had to prove his love with a sacrifice. God proved his love with a sacrifice. That just leaves me with me and you. Hebrews 13, 15. Hebrews 13, 15. That's somebody I need to talk to. Jesus is calling. I need to talk to him. Hebrews 13, 15. 
By him, therefore, let us offer the what? What is a sacrifice? No, no, no. Giving up something that's important to you. Uh-oh. <laughs> the act of giving up something that means something, something desired or something prized by you. Let us offer up the sacrifice of what? Abraham proved himself. God proved himself. Now what about you? How do you prove to God that you love him above all else? How do you prove it? You see, we go through a lot of things. You want to try to prove to your preacher that you love God. You don't get no points for that. You want to try to prove to the church that you love God. You don't get no points for that. You want to try to prove to your neighbors that you love God. You don't get no points for that. The only person who really knows how much you love Him can't be fooled by your little games. Sorry, I believe in keeping it real. By Him, did you catch that? By Him, I can't do anything other than by Him. By Him, therefore, let us offer up the sacrifice of praise to God on Sunday morning. Are you sure some of you read it that way? Hello? The only time we ever, uh, we ever feel like we got to offer up praises on Sunday morning. Listen, I owe him much more than just Sunday morning. And apparently Paul did too because he said, Offer the sacrifice of praise to God. When can you stop after continually? Huh? Over and over and over and over. So what is praise? What is it that I'm supposed to do, preacher? The fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Now I was reading again this morning that word fruit. Fruit means fresh picked. means fresh ripe. God don't want your leftovers. See, in the book of Malachi, if you read the book of Malachi, that's the reason that God shut up the windows of heaven from the book of Malachi to the book of Matthew. About 400 years, God said, I'm sick and tired of you giving me your leftovers and I'm not going to deal with this anymore. Sacrifices back according to the old law should have been a lamb of the first year and it should have been perfect, spotless, and without blemish. Malachi, God said, you're bringing me anything and everything. You're keeping the best to feed at your table and you're bringing me the sick and the lame and everything that's left over. And God said that since you can't give me your best, I'm not giving you anything. And so he shut up the windows of heaven. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God Continually, that is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks. Fruit meaning fresh praise. God don't necessarily want praise for something he did ten years ago. We ought to have some fresh stuff that we can praise him for. Well, preacher, God, God just ain't blessing me. Well, maybe we need to have a talk. Because I can guarantee you, if God ain't blessing you, that, that means you ain't looking right. That means you, you must be in a spirit of depression. Huh? How many knows when you're in a spirit of depression, you can't see the good in nothing or nobody? i tell you something else that'll happen too. If you're not very careful... 
you hang around folks that are depressed and, and want to speak negative. All. Listen, I ain't got time for that mess. Hello? Now, it, there ain't nothing wrong with getting down and out once in a while because even the preacher does that once in a while. There ain't nothing wrong with, listen, I fight with depression and I ain't afraid to tell you, I fight it once in a while. There is no sin, there is no press, there is nothing wrong with falling into a state of depression once in a while. Preacher, I can't believe you just said that. I'm just keeping it real. The problem with depression is you folks that don't want out of it. I don't understand that. You don't want out of depression. And somebody, we had the talk, Brother Roger and I had the talk Friday. Let me tell you, depression is something serious. Don't, don't, don't make fun of somebody that's having depression. Don't poke fun at somebody. Depre- Unless you've had depression, keep your mouth shut. Them people that says you just need to shake it off and read your Bible and just go to... Listen, it ain't that simple. Depression is a demonic spirit that cannot be loose from you until you have prayer and God breaks the chain. For the rest of y'all, there's medication. Sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to His name. Today is Father's Day. A month ago we had Mother's Day. I still say again it's an absolute shame that we have one day set aside a year that we thank our parents for what they've done. Every day we should be thankful. Ever so often in my life, and I've done it in the past, I'll sit down, Brother Steve, and I'll send thank you cards to people that have been an inspiration to me. People in my life that may not know the bearing that they had and the input that had it not been for them, I may not be the individual that I am. Sometimes people just like to know that they've had a part of your life. Abraham had to prove himself to God. God proved himself to mankind. But what are you doing? Today we've set aside the day to thank our fathers and we'll tell them today how much we love them. We'll tell them today what they mean to us and we thank them for the sacrifices and the things that they've done for us and we thank them for being there and we thank them for the impression they've had. But, but so many times this day will pass and then tomorrow we'll go right back to our daily lives. It's not until we set aside a day that we stop and say, thank you. Most of you hadn't figured out that's what services are for. We come to Sunday service so we can thank God. And you know what? You shouldn't have to have a service. Has anybody ever, you know, and I think sometimes we forget, we just got on the sign outside that, We have service at 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock on Sunday. 10 o'clock is for Sunday school. Most of y'all don't know that we have Sunday school on Sunday. No, I ain't going to bother. Y'all already know. 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock we gather in, and what do we call this 11 o'clock hour? What? Worship. Some call it praise and worship. Some of y'all ain't got that figured out. You know what worship is? Some of y'all ain't got that figured out yet. Y'all hold on. Praise and worship. Praise is when you verbally tell God thank you. Worship is when you physically How long have we been having worship services here at Pirate Chapel? Since 67. And we still ain't got it figured out. Hello? Am I the only one that gets that? 
praise and worship service. Praise is when you verbally edify and give God thanks. Worship, see, y'all want to blame this on me, but I didn't institute worship service. Hello? Since 1967, somebody said 11 o'clock on Sunday we'll have worship service. Somewhere along the line, y'all lost the memo. Sunday night on 6 o'clock, we do it again, I think. What what do we do on 6 o'clock on Sunday night? Sunday night's worship too? For real? What about Wednesday night? It's a worship service too? Did everybody know that? Don't y'all look at me that way. It seems a little infantile, but I don't think that we all understand that that's what... This is not a social club. This is not the country club. This is not for an elite set. There is no cliques here. There is no cliques here. You know, and, and I made mention down in Sunday school a while ago, you know, you can see the, the variety of the, of, the, uh, of the personalities just by looking out the parking lot. Yeah. Some drive vans, some drive cars, some drive trucks, some got white, blue, yellow. I, there's, every individual here has their preference on what they like. But when it's all said and done, don't matter what name is on them, don't matter what color they are or how many seats they got, they all still serve the same purpose. They got you to church this morning. And hopefully when we dismiss here in an hour or two, they'll get y'all somewhere to eat. Abraham proved himself. God has proved himself, and you're here this morning to prove yourself. Now, I'm not asking you to put on a show for anybody, because listen, I've been in plenty of churches, and I've seen plenty of people that ought to have got an Academy Award. They were good. But you know what? When it's all said and done, I can't judge them. See, here's the problem we get into. Sister Teresa, will y'all come and sing? I want you to come and sing. When it's all said and done, I hear people say all the time, well, I can't go to church because Bremen ain't nothing but full of hypocrites. I can't go to Pius Chapel because there ain't nothing but hypocrites down there. Depends on who you're asking. Hello? You ask some of us, I don't think we're hypocrites at all. Now, I think we fail sometimes. I think we miss the mark sometimes. Hello? I don't think we always worship like we should. I don't think we always testify like we should. I don't think we always show the love of Christ like we should. But because we miss it one time, does that mean that we're bad apples for the rest of the time? Hopefully we know the grace and the forgiveness of God. Surely to goodness, when God convicts me of my wrong, I can repent. And listen, the Bible tells me that once God forgives me, covers me with his blood, he don't even remember it anymore. So if I go to him today about a sin that I committed yesterday, he's going to say, what sin? Because I've already been forgiven. But you see, we like to drag stuff up. We like to keep reminding folks of things. I want to leave you with this. Abraham proved himself. God proved himself. As they get ready to sing, I just want to thank you, Lord. I want you to find a way. I know this is Father's Day, and a lot of you have already thanked your father. But I just want a few minutes of your time for you to praise 
our Heavenly Father. Amen. Can you stand with me this morning? I just want to thank you, Lord.
turn in. I'm doing Brother Steve's job. Don't forget your Pathway of Hope bottles need to be turned in by this afternoon. Uh, turn them in tonight. If you don't get them in tonight, you can still get them to Sister Frida, but uh, we always go from Mother's Day to Father's Day, so make sure you get these uh, turned in. also want to draw your attention to um, they announced the uh, singing of the Spencers. Um, the bulletin board as you go out on your right going to any uh, announcements that uh, we may have, any flyers that we may have. Uh, some of you uh, may not have Facebook, so uh, several of the uh, pictures from Vacation Bible School are hanging out there, and so uh, take a look at those before you leave. Don't forget we have church tonight, 6 o'clock, and what do we have at 6 o'clock? What? Worship, Worship service. All right. Brother Roger, if you would, dismiss us in a word of prayer. <laughs> 